All right, thank you guys so much for coming. My name is Ashley McDonough, and I work at Oregon State Credit Union. We're based out of the Corvallis area, but kind of all around really the eastern, I'm sorry, the western two-thirds of Oregon. So um, today we're talking personal finance, the basics. And I love this quote about personal finance. It says, financial success is a lot more about minimizing stupid decisions than making really good ones. And I love that because I'm like, okay, I don't even have to completely avoid stupid. I just need to minimize stupid. Like I can handle that. And uh, when we talk about personal finance and success in personal finance, I think there's four pieces to it. Okay. So the first piece is having all the money you need to be able to handle life's daily and monthly expenses. Sound good, right? Knowing that all your bills are going to get paid. Okay. The second piece is being able to handle life's unexpected expenses. So what would be an example of an unexpected life happens moment? Your dog has to go to the vet. Yes, okay, and that can be anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand, right? Pets get really expensive really fast. What else? An unexpected but to be expe to expected event. Broken leg. Broken leg? Yes, any kind of medical emergency is a great one. What else? Your car breaks. Yes, okay, classic. If you have a car, there will at some point be bills associated with having a car, right? So they're unexpected. We, we couldn't really plan for them, but they were to be expected, so we can kind of plan for them at the same time. The third is probably my favorite, and the third is having the freedom to make the financial choices you want, okay? So that freedom might look like, hey, we're going to the coast for the weekend, or we're going to Portland for the weekend, you wanna come? Or it might mean, hey, you know, um, we just had a kid and I'd really like to stay home and be a stay-at-home mom. You know, and that was one of the choices that my husband and I made and I was really thankful to have the freedom to do that one. Um, and then the fourth is being on track for your long-term financial goals. So those are the four steps to financial well-being. And if you're going, well, Ashley, who are you? And really, why should I listen to you as you tell me this? Well, here's my story. So I'm not from Oregon originally. I grew up in Colorado, but came out for college and went to Pacific University in Forest Grove. Met my husband there. We actually got married between our junior and senior year in college. And then it was after college where we started our financial journey. We took Dave Ramsey's financial peace class. Anybody ever heard of Dave Ramsey, financial peace? Okay. So that was our first, like, what? You mean we could get all our student loans paid off? Like we could get out of debt? People do that? They, they pay cash for cars? Really? That happens? And so that was our step, first step on that. And we kind of were on the wagon. We fell off the wagon. And we got excited about it. And we stopped. And, you know, it took us. It was a journey. But that was our start. Um, and then I taught at Central High School in Monmouth, Independence area. So I taught there for a couple years. And then when my kids were born, I was very blessed to be able to make that choice to stay home. Yeah. What did you teach? I taught, that's a great question. I taught, so I was licensed to teach Spanish and French and English for speakers of other languages, but I taught English for speakers of other languages. So ESOL. Those are my two munchkins. They're bigger now. My son Kai is nine, and my daughter Levi turns eight the end of July. So um, I was very blessed to be able to stay home with them. So during that time, I'm staying home with the kids. We ended up buying a house in Lebanon. And my husband's commuting to work in Corvallis every day. And he starts listening to Dave Ramsey's podcast, his radio show. And so he's listening and he's driving his car. And I am not a car person, okay? I just need a car that's going to get me from point A to point B and I don't have to worry about it. That's, that's my car. My husband, on the other hand, like he loves his cars. He had the poor man's lift kit on this. He had the really good sound system. The works, Okay. So as he's listening on his really good sound system, he's driving, listening to Dave Ramsey 30 minutes every day. And he starts realizing, you know, we just have a little bit of debt left except for the house. And actually, my car is worth enough that if I sold my car that I drive every day and I absolutely love, we could be out of debt except for the house. And so he did. This is the car he drove instead. And this picture really doesn't do it justice. This was a car, he'd been a school counselor for years, right? He's parking in the teacher lot at the high school. And this car is a car that most high school students would be embarrassed to have as their first car. Like, 
It had the fuzzy seats, you know. I think it had pink fuzzy dice when we got it. It didn't have any working AC. So in the summer when you were driving it, you got out and you were just dripping buckets of sweat. And in the winter, it leaked. So you were still dripping <laughs> when you got out of the car. But he drove that for over a year so that we could get the last of our debt paid off except for the house. And when I asked him, I said, honey, you know, I started this job and I'm good with numbers, but they don't always stick in my head. I said, how much did we have in student loans? Well, private grad, or private undergrad, we both went to grad school, both got our master's degrees. It was $80,000 in student loan debt that we got paid off, and most of it while I was staying home with the kids. So there's hope to get out of student loan debt. That's, that's a possibility, thank you. Um, so then our kids are old enough to go back to school, and he says, so honey, they're going back to school. You're gonna get back, go back to work? And I was like, oh, I really like being a stay-at-home mom. And stay-at-home mom is so easy when your kids are in school. Like, that's, that's the easiest part of stay-at-home mom. But I thought, okay, for my relationship, I'll, I'll at least look. And so I ended up here at the credit union. This was obviously pre-pandemic at the state capitol talking about the difference between a credit union and a bank. Um, and I love my job. I get to teach, but I don't have to grade papers. <laughs> it's kind of the best of both worlds. So that's a little bit about me and my story. But today we're talking about building your financial house. So think about building a house. What do you need first? Kitchen. Before you can put the kitchen, you got to have the, something for the kitchen to go on. The base, the foundation, right? So the foundation of your financial house is like the, the income and how do you do it, making sure you're paying your monthly bills. Then the walls, you know, insurance, things like that. The roof before we get into the like crazy fancy investing. So today we're gonna talk about the basics, budgeting basics, credit, and savings, all right? Now I always have to talk about this in personal finance because there's this big lie in personal finance, okay? And the lie in personal finance says that if you're bad with money, right, it's because there's something wrong with you. You just must be a bad person if you're bad with money, right? Is that true? No. No, it's a huge lie, okay? The truth is, is that problems with money are so common, okay? And often, they're tied to stressful life events. I don't think any of us could come up with an example of a stressful life event, you know, that's happened over the past year. Nobody has any idea what that would be, right? So, and just like, you guys remember when you learned how to ride a bike? Okay, can all of you ride a bike? Okay, and you could probably almost ride it in your sleep now, right? Like you don't have to pay any attention when you're riding a bike, you just get on and you can go. Because somebody taught us how to do it. Well, personal finance is a skill that can be learned, but unfortunately it's not taught very often. So that's why I love my job, because I get to teach the basics of personal finance. There's only six states in the US that require a semester of personal finance, and Oregon is not one of them. So most of us have never learned the basics. So like riding a bike, take some practice, we fall down a little bit, but it's not that hard to learn the basics. All right, do you guys remember this show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? Am I really that old? <laughs> oh man, okay. Well, well, who would like to be a millionaire? Sound good? Maybe? All right, so I love my job. I get to do kind of fun rabbit hole research. And I started diving in and I looked at how many households were in the US. Okay, so my numbers are a little bit old, but they're still pretty good. So in 2017, there were 126 million households in the US, okay? Out of that 126 million, how many of them do you think were millionaire households? Now this is not the owned a million dollar house. This is they had a million dollars in their bank accounts, in their investment accounts. Go ahead. No, five. Five, it's more than five. I'm gonna say 33. 33, it's more than 33. I'm gonna say 79. 70, keep going. Okay, wait. Two, I'm say 350. Keep going, keep going. 1,600. Keep going. Wait, what about 40,000? Keep going, keep going. 100,000. Keep going. 126 million. Well, are, are you a millionaire? <laughs> yes. Because unless we're all millionaires in this room, it can't be 126 million. All right. I'm going to say 100 million because at least 26 million. <laughs> so there were almost 11 million millionaires. Okay? Which is significantly more than your five that you started with, Kai, right? 11 million millionaires. Okay? And they did a study 
on 10,000 millionaires and they asked them, well, what do you need to be a millionaire? Do you have to inherit a million from your parents? Because if we do, I think I'm hosed, okay? I don't think I'm getting a million from my folks. And they said, no, actually, in that study of 10,000 millionaires, only, I think, less than 80% of them inherited any money whatsoever, okay? So most of them hit their million on their own. They said, there's two things you need. What do you think it takes to become a millionaire? Money, money right? And in order to keep your money and to be able to do something uh, with it, what do you need to have? Intelligence. Intelligence. You know how and it leads to saving consistently. Yes? Working towards your goal. Working towards your goal. Having that discipline. So financial discipline and saving consistently. Okay? Yeah, only 21% received any money whatsoever. All right. So I don't know about you guys, but you got money to burn? Like if you walked down the road and you saw a $10 bill, on the side of the road, you'd be like, eh, I don't really need that 10 bucks. Right? We'd all bend over and pick up the $10. So one of the first parts of that financial discipline, so that we can save consistently, is tracking your spending. Okay? Because you have to know where you're spending it to be able to save it or to be able to make different choices with it. So I don't know about you guys. Let's see. Everybody's in about 10th grade, right? You guys, are you in 10th grade, thereabouts? No, maybe. All right. So um, when I'm tracking my spending, it's amazing how well my car goes from point A to point B without making any stops. Okay, because I'm tracking my spending. I'm like, oh, nope, not going to stop there. If I'm not tracking my spending, I swear my car drives itself through the Dutch Bros lines. Okay, who are my coffee people? Anybody in here a coffee person? A couple. All right, yeah, see, we got one back there. All right, now, my husband drives him bonk. Are you serious? Why, why do you go get coffee at Dutch Bros? Like, just go to McDonald's and get it for a dollar. And I'm like, because I don't want to taste the coffee in my coffee. That's, that's why I do it that way. But McDonald's is his weakness, right? So who are my fast food people? Anybody? We got some? Okay. So if you're tracking your spending, all of a sudden you realize, do you realize how much I'm spending a year on coffee or how much I'm spending on fast food? Or for me, you know what, the other one that gets me. So I always have to start, and this is how my mom taught me to do it when I was like super little. You figure out, okay, this is what we're going to eat this week. And then based on that, let's look what's in the cupboard. What do we need to put on our grocery list? And now we're going to go grocery shopping with our list and we're going to shop off the list. Well, if I don't do that and I forget and shoot, we're halfway through the week and I realize I'm out of bread for peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for my kids' lunches. Right? I go to the store to get bread. How much is a loaf of bread? Isn't it like $3 to $5? Yeah, depending on what kind of bread you get, $3, $5, something around in there. But if I go to the grocery store for a loaf of bread, we'll say a $3 loaf of bread, how much is it going to cost me to go to the grocery store? About 30 to 50 bucks. <laughs> You've done this. <laughs> you know how this works, right? The grocery store, like you just impulse buy. Like if you're not tracking your spending, and so for me, grocery shopping and meal planning is one of those like track your spending things. All right. So when I got this job, I started thinking back, like what are some of my personal experiences with this? Well, I remember I was younger than you guys, and we used to stop at Einstein's Bagels. Has anybody ever been to an Einstein's Bagels? They're not. They're hardly here in Oregon. In Colorado, where I grew up, they're everywhere. And they're kind of like the Starbucks of bagel shops, okay? They're yummy bagels, but they're kind of spendy. And we got in the habit of stopping at Starbucks or at Einstein's Bagels Sunday after church. We'd stop, we'd get some smears, you know, like with cream cheese, and then we'd buy a dozen bagels for the week because we packed our lunches. And it's cheaper to pack your own lunches, and so we packed our lunches, but sandwiches just taste better on bagels. So we'd stop and we'd get these bagels. Well, one day, my dad figured out how much, he started tracking our spending, how much we spent on bagels. And you can ask yourself, and it might not be bagels for you, but think about those things that you constantly spend money on. How much is that a week? How much is that a year? Right? Over the course of the month, how much is it for a year? He came home and he goes, no more bagels. You guys aren't allowed to eat any more bagels. When I got this job, I called him. I said, Papa, do you remember when you told us we couldn't have any more bagels? He goes, no, I never said that. I never said no more. I'm like, yes, you did. I called my mom up. Hey, mom, do you remember when Papa told us no more bagels? Yes, 
I remember that conversation vividly. <laughs> I said, how much were you guys spending on bagels? She said, when he tracked it, it was 20% of our food budget on bagels, <laughs> right? Because if you're not tracking, that's what can happen. All right, so a couple things are critical when we're talking about bills. Now, anybody in here live on their own? Paying bills? Not yet. Okay, so this is kind of theoretical knowledge for you, so I'm going to go quick because we have other things that can be more applicable. But timing is so important. If I look at this income, I have enough to pay all the bills, but the timing is off. The dates are off. Also, knowledge is power. So I need to know what happens if I'm late on a bill, right? What's the grace period on a bill? Isn't that like, I'm not even gonna guess, because I'm gonna say like a week, and it's gonna be like, oh, what do you mean? It's like, isn't it like two or three days after or something like that? Yeah, it depends. And that's why it's so important to know, because for example, my electricity, you know, it's five days. My rent, it's three days, okay? Depending on it, like my mortgage currently, it's like two weeks. So it just depends, but it's that period of time where you have kind of some grace, right? If your check is in the mail and it's on the way, and we're not gonna charge you a late fee, but what happens if you're late? Or what happens if you miss the grace period? Or is there no grace period at all? Those kinds of things are important to know as we're paying bills on our own. Okay, bill calendar is really helpful to help you do this because you can figure out when your payday is and when your bills are due, okay? So you can kind of plan it out. I even like to put, did I put it on this one? Yes, okay, so I even like to put like my personal life. I'm gonna be out of town on the 5th, 6th, and 7th, but I have to pay my cell phone bill on the 7th and I get paid on the 6th. Like, are those set up on auto pay or do I need to do something about it before I go out of town? And I better know that I'm going out of town because that's probably um, means I'm going to spend a little bit more if I'm out of town, right? So these are just great tools to have. But again, I'm going quick on these because we have other stuff that's more applicable. And you guys aren't paying bills yet. Does anybody have any bills they pay right now? I know when I was your age, I was paying my own cell phone and I was paying car insurance, I think, and a car payment. Okay. All right. Any questions so far? All right. We're going to get to the fun stuff. I'm gonna zoom ahead so I see. All right, I have all kinds of weird analogies, but to me, budgeting is like cookies. Okay, show of hands, who are chocolate chip people? Chocolate chip cookies. Okay, we got some chocolate chip cookie people in here. What about peanut butter? Some peanut butter, snickerdoodle, oatmeal raisin. Okay, what is it? No cookies? No cookies whatsoever. What would you have yeah. instead of cookies? Brownies are better. Brownies, okay. Brownies. Do you put anything in your brownies? Do you like nuts in your brownies? Do you like no. mint chocolate chip? Just plain brownies? Yes. Okay, do they, are they fudgy or do you like them kind of cake-like? Cake-like. Okay. Like you were like, I did not know I was going to get quizzed on my snack habits when I came in here. All right. So, all of us have different favorites, right? And budgeting is personal like that. I would say it's called personal finance for a reason because you have to figure out what works for you personally. So personally, I like a peanut butter cookie with oatmeal in it and chocolate chips, right? And you could take my recipe for my favorite cookies and your oven might work a little bit different than mine. So even if I give you exactly my recipe, it might turn out a little bit different. Or you might not be paying attention and you flip-flop the sugar and the salt and all of a sudden these amazing cookies are gonna taste horrible, right? So budgeting is like that. You have to figure out what works for you and what system and you know, have a recipe and then you're gonna to have to tweak it and modify it and this is gonna make it taste great, this is gonna make it worse, you know, all of those things. So we're gonna figure out your own personal cookie recipe for your budget. All right, now personally, this is not me. This would never be me. I am the person, if you watch, if I was walking around this room more, you would probably see me trip on this floor. It's perfectly smooth, right? I can still trip on a perfectly smooth floor. So you're not gonna catch me at the edge of a canyon with no guardrails, right? <laughs> that is not me. And it's not me in my personal finances either, okay? I like to make things as easy as possible. And I like to make it so I don't have to think about it, okay? 
Because what are some other things going on in your guys' lives? Right? What's going on? We got a job that we're starting. What else? School. School. Not really anymore, but... Okay. But when school starts up again, what else? Anything else going on? Driving. Driving. Okay. Thinking about getting our driver's license. How am I going to get, you know, driver's ed in there? All of that. Okay. What about personal relationships, family? Family stuff always comes up, right? Or romantic relationships. Like there's always other things to be thinking about. Okay. So I like to have my budget set up so that it has the guardrails on it. There are places. So we live in Lebanon and my in-laws live in Bend. So we make that drive quite a bit. Okay. Anybody done that drive from like Corvallis to Bend? And there's a couple places on that pass. And I go, how is there not a guardrail here? <laughs> like, do you see this? It's like, boom. And ugh, I need guardrails. Or, okay, who are my drivers? We got a couple drivers in here. Okay, what if you're just driving down the highway here, and if you've ever been where it goes, boom, 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 right? You're getting out of your lane, and it gives you that warning. Okay, that's how I have my budget set up. So that it has the guardrails, it has the bump, 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 be careful, actually, set up. So one of the things I like, how many of you guys have bank accounts? Okay, a couple people with bank accounts. So I always talk about it's important to bank, but bank well. Because with a bank account, it allows you to do a lot of things, like set up those guardrails. So, for example, in your bank account, if you've got a bank account, you can have it set up so that it texts you when a large withdrawal comes out. And you get to decide what that is. That could be $50, that could be $100, that could be $500. Okay, personally, I like it. I get a text if I spend more than $100, I get a text. Hey, did you realize $100 just came out of your account? You can set it up so that you get a low balance alert. Right, hey, there's only $100 left in your account. You might wanna put some money in or just pay attention to your spending, right? Start tracking. You've only got $100 left in that account. You can have it set up so, and I'll show you my setup, so that it transfers money automatically and does the great things automatically. Okay, so since we don't have too many people with bank accounts in here, we're gonna go off script. Um, what's the difference between a bank and a credit union? Anybody know? Okay, so credit unions and credit cards. You can get a credit card at a bank or a credit union. It's a great guess. You can get a, a credit card at either. What about if I need a savings account, where should I go? A bank. A bank, can I get a savings account at a credit union? You can, you can get a, bank, a savings account, you can get a checking account, you can get a credit card, you can get a debit card, you could get a home loan, you could get a car loan at either one. So then what's the difference? Uh, isn't credit union free? Okay, so a credit union is tied up in the membership. You're right. So at a bank, you have customers and you have shareholders. And you walk into a bank and you're a customer. Okay, and a bank is a business. And what does a business want to do? Take your money. Earn profit, right? Okay, a business is in it for profit. At a credit union, we don't have customers and shareholders, we have members, okay? So if you're a member of a credit union, you're a member and an owner. So we're not trying to make a profit, we're a not-for-profit. Any profit we make gets passed back to the membership in terms of you know, different services we offer or better rates, fees, things like that. So we're not in it to make a profit and that's a huge difference. So I highly recommend everybody have a bank account, whether you have it at a bank or a credit union you know, I have, my, I have my personal preferences there. I don't really care though, but bank, but bank well. Do you know how much it costs on average to not have a bank account? If you have a regular job, you're getting a paycheck, and you don't have a bank account, how much does that cost you to not have a bank account? Yeah. Well, think about it, Kai. So I'm paying you, right? You've got your paycheck. You don't have a bank account to deposit it in. So what are you gonna do? Put it away. Are you going to be able to access your money? Yeah. How? Put it in my wallet. Put it in your wallet. And then you need, you know, oh, I got to stop for gas. They don't want your paycheck. They don't want the whole amount, right? 
So you got to go deposit it for cash. You got to deposit it for cash. But if I don't have a bank account to deposit it into, I'm going to have to pay somebody to cash my check. Okay, and then I need to pay a bill, and I need to be able to write a check to pay a bill. I'm going to have to do a money order. Okay, and that's going to cost me too. So on average, the fact that I don't have a bank account means that it costs me between like $250 and $500 a year just to not have a bank account. Is that more than you'd pay for a bank account? It, yeah, especially if you put your guardrails up. Because a lot of times people say, oh, I don't like bank accounts because they charge you for like, if you don't have enough money and then they give you an overdraft fee and that's $30 and I got three of them in one day and ah. But if you bank and bank well, you can do it free or for a very minimal amount, okay? So let's say you're like, okay, Ashley, you convinced me, I need a bank account. You go in to open an account. What happens, what do you need? But you need like um, amount of money to put in. Okay, a lot of times you're gonna need to have a certain amount to deposit to open the account. Okay, at the credit union, you have to deposit $5, and that's kind of your share in the membership. So you need $5. You have to have $10 is the like fee to open the account, and then $25 gets you a checking account also. And the $25 is in your checking account, it's yours to spend, so it really just costs you the $10, but you need 40. So let's say someone wanted to open up an account and they came in with their paycheck, mm -hmm. they just like give you the paycheck and then you could take the fees out of that and then set up an account, or would you have to actually have the money available right over there? I think you could probably do it with a paycheck. There's a couple other things you need though. Okay, so opening an account is a, you're signing a contract with whatever financial institution you choose. So you're going to have to be 18 or have somebody with you that can sign with you and they'll be joint on that account and they'll have access to those funds as well. So that's something to consider. Um, a lot of times when you open an account, they're gonna run two reports on you. And at your guys' age, there's not gonna be anything on these reports, but they're still gonna run them. They're going to run your checks report, which shows your relationship with other financial institutions. Because I want to know, did you commit a bunch of ATM fraud at the bank down the road? Okay, I need to know that before I start an account with you. Or, and they're going to run your credit report. And we're going to talk about that. Okay? So, some things to think about, but it's, I highly recommend having at least a basic bank account. I'll show you my system, though. All right. So, you're like, Ashley, I took your financial class. It was great. It's going to be smooth sailing from here, right? Just smooth sailing. No, this is really what it looks like right? as you do personal finance. Like windy roads, back and forth. It's a learning process. You've got to have different systems, different expenses, fixed, variable, periodic. I'm going to skip that because we're not into those expenses right now. All right, but person, I can talk. Part of budgeting is the knowing the difference between a, a need and a want, right? It's the tale of two apples. They're both... Apples, right? They're both needs. No, <laughs> we got to distinguish what's a need and a want. So, all right, food. Is it a need or a want? A need. A need. My husband's McDonald's addiction. Is it a need or a want? A want. want. Okay, so some of them get tricky. Cell phones. Need or want? Need. You no. Must, you must. You kind of have to now because, like, when we came in, we had to sign up. Like, we had to put in our phone number. So, like, they're kind of necessary now. Does anybody still have a home phone? <laughs> right? So I could, you could easily convince me that a cell phone is a need. I'm fine with that. Okay? Is the latest, greatest iPhone a need or a want? No. Want. <laughs> okay? So you got to be careful because some of them, it's a slippery slope, right? All right. There's always places to save in your budget. We talked about groceries, right? Making that meal plan ahead of time. A lot of times those subscription services, right? You sign up for a free trial and then you forget and all of a sudden you realize, wow, I'm paying for Hulu Plus, Disney, and Netflix, and I don't know, ABC or something, you know? <laughs> and I'm not ever home to watch TV, so maybe I should think about canceling at least a few of those, okay? We have to find the balance. And this is what experts recommend, 50% are less in needs 20% are more in savings and 30% are less in wants, okay? That 50% needs, again, we have to be really strict about what's a need and what's a want. The reason they keep it at 50% is if something happens and like you're on unemployment, it's usually 50%, so you can at least cover your needs. All right, so here's my budget. I'm gonna skip this one. All right, 
At your age, do you guys need a budget? Yes. Yeah. You're like, this is a trick question, Ashley. I don't know. Do I need a budget? I don't want to say the wrong thing. Well, it's, if you don't have a budget, like, I know I could spend a couple hundred dollars online. Okay. So you should have a budget for yourself. If we're not tracking, it's easy to spend, right? Okay. It's good practice, too. It doesn't have to be super complicated. This one is actually lined up for how often you get paid. Okay, so it's a weekly. And in this example, we've got our 20% in savings. We've got our 50% needs and our 30% wants. But you have to be careful because budgets are living, breathing documents. And they'll lie. Oh, here we go. All right, so if I thought I was going to spend 150 in week two on needs, but I actually spend 200, then I need to make sure my 250 I have left budgeted actually just becomes 200. Okay? And then I only have 700 to get through week three. And I better spend less on once. All right. So I'm going to show you guys my system. Because life happens when you start budgeting. And this is why it's good to practice now and to start tracking. Okay? Because L in life happens is the listed item is undercalculated. Right? I thought I only spent $5 a week on coffees. But when I actually track, I spend closer to 15 Okay? Or food. or It always cracks me up what my husband thinks we spend on food. Okay? I is an impulse purchase. There's your online purchases, right? Impulse purchase. F, I totally forgot that this was the month my car insurance was due. I, e is it's an emergency. All right, you're like, Ashley, what is with the two checking accounts? Remember I said bank, but bank well? Yeah. All right. This is what budgeting starts to look like. All right, here's my system. Whoop. So I have a main checking account, and then from that main checking account, I have all these guardrails, right? An automatic system. So in my main checking account, it gives my paycheck. It automatically gets transferred part of it into bills checking. Nothing is allowed to come out of bills checking unless it's paying a bill. And I have all my bills set up on auto pay. So I never have to worry about that, right? That's that first part of financial freedom, okay? And then I have a second set that goes into a series of savings accounts. And it happens automatically. So I have it so that I have my peace of mind fund, right? My, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to need money at some point. I've got my vacation fund. I've got my pet fund. We talked about <laughs> emergencies for vets, right? I've got a clothing fund. I've got a car fund. I've got all kinds of funds. And it just trickles down automatically so that I don't have to think about it. There's my budget on autopilot. And I spend almost no time actually budgeting. Okay? But what do you need to make this work? Money. You need money. You need a paycheck coming in, right? And a job. well, what what do I have here at the top? Uh, a system. A system. A main checking account. A bills checking account. I need a bank account of some kind, right? So bank, but bank well. All right. What questions do you guys have for me? All right. We're gonna jump right into credit so that we can get through. All right. Is it a tool? Is it a trap? It's really up to you and how you use it, right? They had to change. Oh wait, the average American. All right, how many credit cards does the average American have in their wallet? Oh, four. Four, five, seven, seven two. two, one. You guys are close. It's three. Okay. Oh, I know. Now, how much do they have in revolving debt that they don't pay off every month? Forty-seven dollars. Forty-seven dollars. It's more than 47. 4,000. 4, it's actually, nope, it's more than 4,000. 8,200. Not quite. 6,500. 6, month to month, they don't pay. That not paying it off every year costs them an extra $1,100 in interest a year. Okay? In America as a whole, we have a whopping $413.7 in unpaid credit cards. Why would you make more money? Okay? It gets expensive. They actually had to change the laws to make it so that you couldn't get a credit card at too young of an age. Okay? They used to do this, like when you were in college, they had all kinds of things. You get a free t-shirt, you get a free pizza, all kinds of things. This is the free t-shirt that I got. Okay? My sister stole it and I showed up to family vacation. I was like, wait, that's my Wells Fargo. Okay? And at the time I didn't realize it was for a credit card. I didn't sign up for a credit card with them, but I still got the free t-shirt. 
So they had to change it, that you couldn't market to 21-year-olds. All right, but credit is a part of our lives. It's important to see how it works. So credit scores, right, and your credit report. How is it made up? Why do we need to know? All right, I'm going to skip ahead to show you guys how important it is, and then we're going to back up. All right, so what difference does it make if you have good credit? Uh, These are... What? I said you probably get approved for a loan better and like you want to buy a car. Okay. You need to go pull out like five grand that you didn't have. If you have better credit, you'll probably be able to get it. Okay. So I'm looking to buy a car. That's a big thing people put on credit. What else do people borrow money for? House. House. Bills. Huge one. Bills. It's dangerous to put bills on credit. We don't want to put too much because we want to get them paid off every month. But we could if like money gets really crazy tight. A business. A business, okay. Um, what about groceries? groceries? Vehicle. Vehicle. You turn 18, you get to make a big decision. School. School, okay. College is a huge one, right? That was our $80,000 in debt was the student loans, okay? Weddings. Weddings get crazy expensive. People don't think about it. the average cost of a wedding in Oregon. You want to know what it is? Oh, I want to guess five grand. More. Ten. Keep going. Twenty-five. Yeah, it's twenty-six thousand. Is the average cost of wedding the most expensive state to get married in? New Jersey. Nope, nope. New York. New York. It's almost a hundred grand on average for a wedding in New York. Just, just a little. Even more expensive than Hawaii. All right. So. <laughs> credit is probably going to be a part of our lives. There's probably going to be something at some point that you're going to want to borrow money for. And we can use it responsibly, use it as a tool, and so that's okay. But what happens when we borrow? Interest is the money you pay. It's like the rent you pay on the money you borrow. So I have two examples. Okay, These are real car loans that came through the credit union. Real numbers. They didn't fudge any numbers. Okay, Person A has excellent credit. They get a $20,000 loan, okay? They've got excellent credit, so their interest rate is 3.24, and their monthly payment is 317 a month, okay? Which is lower than average for a used car payment. Somebody, person B comes in with fair credit. The loan amount is almost the same, right? I try to get them as close as possible. The interest rate's where the difference is, 9.99% interest. That means their monthly payment is now 386. Okay? But I have a question. So, with the interest, is that how much of the percent that you pay back every month? Mm hmm. 400? That's the cost of borrowing money. $10? 10 dollars? 10 percent. Now, the reason it changes is because depending on what your credit score is, somebody with excellent credit, I know statistically, they're going to pay back their loan 98% of the time. So I'm not really worried about lending them money. I can give them a break on the rate. Okay, but somebody with fair credit, 50% of the time, they're not going to pay me back. So it's going to cost them more because it's a higher risk for me. Okay, so what happens? The person with excellent credit, the rent they have to pay because they borrowed my money, it's still going to cost them almost $2,500 in interest, $2,408 in interest over the life of the car loan, okay? So that $20,000 car was actually a $22,000 car. It's not horrible, right? It was a used car? Yep, a used car. $22,000 for a used car? Well, think about it. There's all kinds of different used cars. You could get a used Tesla, you know? If I'm paying $22,000 for a used car, that car better be... <laughs> well, and you got to make those decisions for you. Okay, but my fair credit friend, $20,000 on their car, by the time they pay their 9.99% interest, they actually pay $7,000 in interest. Do you have an extra $7,000 lying around? No. You sure? All right, so maybe we should just figure out how to do credit right. Okay. What did they look at? How did they figure out this like mystical credit score? What do they care about? Oh, okay, wait, I know this one. So your credit score 
is like, you, if you want a higher credit score, you want to pay your bills on time, you want to pay back money that you borrow, and yeah. Have you been reading my PowerPoint slides ahead of time? No, not actually. Are you sure? All right, so 35% of it is paying your bills on time. That payment history, that's the biggest thing. And if you're late, but you were late five years ago, that's not gonna impact it nearly as much as if you were late last month, okay? Because it's weighted to be more, more weight on the most recent history. 30% of it is your credit usage. So I have a credit card that lets me borrow $1,000. Do I have it maxed out? Or do I keep it at around $300, okay? 15% is the length of credit history. How long do I have information on you? Right, is this a brand new account? Or I'm like, yeah, they've been paying, and I have history of like the last seven years of payments. I'm not worried about it, they're fine, okay? 10% is new credit. Am I going around opening all kinds of new credit accounts, new credit cards, shopping for a new credit card, and I bought a car, and I bought a house. Like, too much new credit. And then 10% is the mix. Is it all credit cards? Is there a mix of student loans in there? Do we have some home loans? Do we have a car loan in there? Like, what's the mix, okay? But you can see here, whoop, it makes a huge difference how much we have in that loan. All right, something else that makes a huge difference. I'm gonna skip ahead. All right, if you have debt, hopefully nobody in here has debt, right? My 10th graders don't have debt yet. All right, but let's see what the impact is if you do. Okay, so this is how my husband and I got out of debt. We used the debt snowball method. And we even had, on our budget, we had it called the wall of the slain. So we could like see the wins of, yes, we got that one paid off. Yes, we got that one paid off. Okay, look what happens. So here's my person. They have some bills. Okay. When you do the debt snowball, all you look at is the balance. So my dentist, I owe them $675. My student loans, I've got $12,000 on those. So I rank them lowest to highest in terms of the balance. What's not showing up on there? Bills. Uh, you're right, I'm only showing my debts, okay? And I owe 24,000, but what's missing? Remember when we think about those car loans, right? What was the difference between the two? One of them higher interest. Interest rate, so I'm not showing my interest rate, I'm just showing the payments, okay? And I'm gonna keep tracking my wins. Now look, which one is higher interest rate, the credit card or the student loan? The credit card, the credit card so right? At almost 20% interest, and the student loans at 6% interest. So why am I paying the credit card um, off? Well, actually, so that makes sense. But the, like, why don't I have those flip-flopped, right? Because we really just care about the balance because we want to get those small wins paid off. So look what happens with my hypothetical person. Okay, they just pay the minimum on those payments. Okay, they're debt free in 2035 and they pay $20,000 in interest. Okay, this is without adding any more, they didn't buy any more cars, they didn't add any other medical debt, right? they just paid the minimum, Fif almost 15 years to get out of debt and I pay $20,000 in interest. That's not a whole life. Okay, right? Now, if I use the debt snowball method, and the debt snowball says when I'm done paying my dental bill, then I'm gonna take that $15 payment and I'm gonna add it to my car payment. And then when I'm done paying my car payment, I'm gonna add both of those payments to my credit card. And then when I'm done paying my credit card, I'm gonna add both of those to my student loan. Okay, if I do that, look at how much faster I get out of debt. And it saves me almost $11,000 in interest. Okay? Not to mention that it saves me $465 a month, eight and a half years early, okay? Which if I add that up, that's almost 50,000. That's $47,430 right there. If I added a little bit of extra, and I said I'm gonna do all of it plus the $50 extra month, look at how much more that saves me, okay? So when you figure out the debt snowball, Okay, ideally we want to stay out of debt to begin with, but when we get into debt, we want to debt snowball it out. Okay, this time my husband and I paid it off. All right, any questions? 
you tracking with me? All right, we started about 15 minutes late, so can I go a little bit longer? Okay, because we haven't talked about savings yet. And the sad truth is America has a savings crisis, okay? This is pre-pandemic numbers. 40% of Americans couldn't handle an emergency of $400 without borrowing money, putting on a credit card, or selling something, right? $400. Okay, but it doesn't take much. You said the vet bill was 300, right? So it doesn't take much to hit that $400 emergency. So we got to figure out how to save. The way I look at it, there's four reasons to save. First is the safety net. Have you ever heard the expression, pay yourself first? No. No? no? Have you heard, a penny saved is a penny earned? Yeah. Okay. My grandpa always said that one. He's probably the first millionaire I ever met. So pay yourself first means before you spend money on anything, you need to put some money to set aside in savings because those emergencies are going to happen, right? You need your rainy day fund. Did anybody heard have a rainy day fund? My little sister calls it her GOK fund because God only knows when you're going to need that money, okay? And they say to have three to six months set aside for emergencies. All right, show of hands. Does anybody in here know someone who was not affected financially because of the pandemic? Mm. Like their job, like you had somebody in your life that had something going on with their job because of the pandemic, right? Everybody in here knows of at least somebody who got their hours cut, who lost their job, who's on unemployment. Like we can see why we might need three to six months of emergencies. And in fact, some people say it really should be closer to 12 months. And I can't imagine why they would think 12 months of emergencies, right? We're gonna talk about that. All right, then we have the sinking fund. Remember, this is number two on our financial, that unexpected but to be expected expenses, my vet bills, right? My car breaks down. I have them for all kinds of things. So, I don't know if you guys knew this. This might be a news flash to some of you, but Christmas is December 25th. Did you know, who knew that one? Okay, it's always December 25th, like every year. It's, it's amazing how that happens. Okay, so this last Christmas, December 2020, there's nothing going on, right? There's no like crisis of any kind. And then Christmas, and then on top of that, my son has the gall to outgrow all of his clothes, okay? Little kids, like you try to put a brick on their head or you threaten to stop, they still grow. So Christmas rolls around, December rolls around, and now all of a sudden I need to go Christmas shopping and I need to go clothes shopping, okay? These things that happen. Well, because I had sinking funds for each of those things, I was like, oh yeah, no problem. Because I have in my budget, you know, with my automatic systems, I automatically set aside like $20 a month for clothing. And I automatically set aside for gifts. So December rolls around, I've got to go clothes shopping and gift shopping. And I just look at my account and I say, okay, I've got this much for Christmas, so I've got this much for clothes. And it didn't affect my budget at all because I'd set up those sinking funds. Okay, you can do it now for you guys. I'm guessing you don't have seven-year-olds who are, or nine-year-olds, he's nine now, oh my goodness, nine-year-olds who are outgrowing their clothes, right? But what are some things that you might be able to save up for as a sinking fund? Car. Car fund, okay? And did you know that if you have an account at any kind of financial institution, you can nickname it? So it doesn't have to be like account, you know, one, two, three, four, five. It can be my car fund. And you could even get more specific because if you're saving for a car, Kai, what kind of car do you want? Any car that runs. <laughs> any car that runs, okay. So my first car. But some of us have those dream cars, right? So you could nickname it, this is my... Okay, this is my Impala fund. Okay, so you know what you're saving for. All right, what other kind of th funds might you guys want to save up for? Insurance. Insurance, okay. That's a good one. Did you know if you pay car insurance and you pay it every six months, you get a discount? So I have a sinking fund that in my bills checking, I pay my insurance monthly, but in reality, I pay it every six months because I get the discount. But I pay it monthly in my sinking fund. You're right. That's a great one. What else? Travel. All right, where do you want to go? Uh, Brazil. Brazil. Oh, okay, it's beautiful. It's sunny, really great food, right? So you have your Brazil, and you could even put 
Brazil 2024 or whatever the year is you're planning on going, right? And you've got it transferring in there every month. You're putting a little bit aside for that. And then and something comes up and your friends say, hey, we're going to go to a concert in Portland. Do you want to come? You're like, well, yeah, let me check my bank account. Okay, I don't have any money in my spending account, but I have some in my Brazil fund. Hmm, do I want to use it for the concert? Or do I want to keep saving for Brazil? It's easier to save money if it's an account that has a name on it. Okay? So, okay, yeah, exactly. So you know which one. They, they laugh at me when I go to the credit union. I say, okay, I need to put some money in my account or I'm pulling some money out. They're like, okay, Ashley, which account? You've got like 12 accounts in here. I'm like, okay, but I need to put it in the whatever it is. Okay, what else? What else might you guys want to have a sinking fund for? A saving up for? Car, travel, those are great ones. A house? A house? You could start saving for your house now. That would be great. Mortgage. Okay, yeah, mortgage. College. All kinds of things. College fund. Mm-hmm. Lots of options. All right. Those are the goals, too. So we've got sinking funds. We've got goals. Those kind of go hand in hand sometimes. Sometimes they're a little bit different. And then, of course, retirement. So four reasons that it's good to save. All right. I gave you guys pins, so you're going to start writing down numbers, all right? So I'm going to ask you a series of questions. We're going to figure out what your emergency fund number should be, okay? So you can use that savings budgeting piece of paper. You're just going to jot down a series of numbers, okay? Everybody has to participate. All right. This is my really scientific, heavily researched questionnaire, okay? Really scientific. All right. Do you have kids? If you have kids, yes, two points, no, zero points. Can you tell I use this presentation with all ages, okay? Do you have a pet? Okay, zero points. Do you have a significant other, but you live on one income? If you're single, you have one point. If yes, and you live off both incomes, it's two points. Wait, what? So this is if you're living like with your significant other. Oh, no. Okay? So... You guys could put one point or zero points on that one probably, okay? Do you have reasonable job security? What was that one? Reasonable job security. What does that mean? Like you're not about to lose your job. That job is gonna stay there. It's, a, it's an essential industry, right? So all of you guys probably are at two points on that one because how many of you guys have jobs? Uh, you got a job? Not Where do you work? I work for you at council. Okay, cool. All right, so you might decide that would be a one point for you as opposed to a two point. All right, do you have a high savings rate of 30% or more? So every time you get a paycheck, you put 30% of it into your savings account. Okay, if you answer no to that one, it's two points. If you lose your job, do you have access to unemployment? They, they'll pay you when you lose your job. You guys are probably at no one point. So everybody give yourself one point on that one. I don't even think we're old enough to do that one point. All right, so one point. All right, this is your personal. Do you have high, low, or medium risk tolerance? So my husband has crazy high risk tolerance. I have crazy low risk tolerance. So I always give myself two points. He gets zero points. Like, are you a person who likes to take risks? Oh. Money or anything? Do you like to take risks? Okay. I'll go Give yourself a point or two. All right, anybody have a car yet? Okay, so you got zero points on your car. Do you have other sources of income? Anybody got two jobs or a side hustle? Okay. Do you have a cushy lifestyle you could easily trim back? That one's always cracks me up. All right. That you have a ton of that you spend in once, but you wouldn't need to if it was an emergency. All right, so go ahead and add up your points. Six, six, seven, eight. Okay, now look at this. Even with six to eight points, they say, well, you probably should still have three to six months saved up in your emergency fund. Okay, think about if you had answered yes to more of those questions. You have kids, you have a house, all of those things, okay? 
Saving up for an emergency is so important. All right. We already talked about our sinking funds. Okay, what's the difference between saving and investing? Uh, investing is putting your money into something, hopefully, hoping that it like goes up so you can get more. And then saving is putting your money away and it's you know that you have that money. Okay, yeah. Saving, I put it somewhere, I didn't spend it. Investing, I'm actually expecting to make money with my money. Okay, they're two different things. We're going to talk about the tale of two savers, and they actually are a little bit investors. All right, saver A, what are we going to call him? Phil. Phil? Yep. Okay. So Phil, and then who's his buddy? Phil. Bob. All right, what did you Marcus. say? Marcus. Marco. Marco? Phil and Marco. Okay. So Phil and Marco get a little bit of a bet going. Okay. And they say, we're graduating high school together. I bet I will have more money in retirement than you. No way. I'm going to so beat you. I'm planning on going to law school. I'm going to be a lawyer. You know, live in New York, spend $100,000 on my wedding. I'm going to beat you. Okay? So Phil starts saving when he's 22 years old. So he gets out of college and he goes, you know, I have been living like a poor, starving college student this whole time. I'm just going to keep living like a poor, starving college student. I, I know how to do this. This is easy. I'm going to start saving now, and I'm going to save $2,000 a year. Okay? So I'm going to live. I'm not going to live to my full income potential. I'm going to stay below my income, and I'm going to save $2,000 a year. Okay? So at 22, he starts saving $2,000 a year. And because, you know, that's what they said. A penny saved is a penny earned. I better get started now. Okay? So life happens to Phil. And after about 12 years, he realizes, you know, life has changed. I'm, I'm married now. I've got some kids. I've got to start thinking about kids' college and everything. I kind of need that $2,000 a year. I think I'm going to stop. I'm going to pause on my savings. Okay? Marco, on the other hand, gets out of college and goes, oh, my goodness. I have been living like a poor car starving college student. i got a great job now. I'm going to live it up. I'm going to get that brand-new truck that I've been wanting. I'm going to get the nice house and the nice neighborhood, and I am just going to live it up. Okay, and then when he turns about 34, he realizes, oh, shoot, I had that bet with Phil. I better start saving. Okay, but I've been living at my income or above it, so I think I can only save about $2,000 a year. I'm going to save $2,000 a year from now until I retire. Okay, so at 65, they get together again, and they say, okay, show me your bank balance. Who wins? Phil. Phil, who started saving at 22 and stopped at 34, or Marco, who saved for extra, he's put in more money over the long term, right? But Marco. he started saving later. I think Marco. Marco, because he put more in? Yeah. Does he have a It doesn't matter. He just put more in. Okay, in terms of how much he actually deposited. Sit. So Phil is Susie Saver. Okay, she hits her one, he hits his $1 million mark. Okay, all he deposited was that $2,000 a year for 12 years. Sam Spinner, because he waited, that's Marco, doesn't even make half a million. Okay, the power of starting to save early. So let's make it a little more personal. What about you guys? Okay, my grandpa said a penny saved is a penny earned. What happens? Oh, I have that same thing. I have, well, that jug or whatever. You have the jar with the pennies in it? No, uh, no it looks exactly like that. I just turned <laughs> one of these in at the credit union yesterday with my kids. I had like 50 bucks in there. A penny saved is a penny earned. All right, so what happens? All right, if we start at 18, anybody in here over 18 of this crew? Nobody's over 18, right? Are you 18? No. Okay, right, you guys are 15, 16. Um, 14. 14. My goodness. Okay, see? Mine's 11 years old. Okay. If we start at 18 and we save $100 a month, it's $25 a week, what would you have to do or give up to find $25 a week? Oh, get a job. You'd have to get a job. Okay, get a job and then make sure I automatically save my $25 a week. Yeah. Okay? What do you think? Do I hit my million? Yes. 
Well, for how long? A hundred dollars a month from age 18 to 67, which is when you can retire. Yeah. Okay. Watch me, I'll do it. All right. Now remember, <laughs> we're gonna earn a return. So this is investing. I put it in my S and P 500, just in a basic stock market mix index fund. Okay. Let's go. 3.4 million. Okay. <laughs> now, look what happens if I wait till I'm 22. Four years cost me a million dollars. Because I waited. Okay. But what happens if at 22, I say, you know what? The average car payment is just around $400 a month. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to save up. I'm going to pay cash for my car. I'm not doing a car payment. And instead, I'm going to put that money into my investing account. Are you teaching us how to be a million? At 22. Well, I asked you who, who wants to be a millionaire at the beginning. Right? Oh, Look what happens. Awesome. This is how. This is how. Look what happens. If I put in $375, even if I start at age 22, $8 million. What if I started now? You could do that. It'd be even higher. You can look. You can look up for an investment calculator. Now, to start now, it's the same as with a bank account. What are you going to need? A job. Well, you don't have to have a job to have a bank account. But it's a contract, so you're going to need to have somebody who's over 18 on the account with you. I can spend a million dollars. Okay. All right. Now let's let's get wild and crazy. Let's say at age 21, I get an inheritance of $50,000, okay? And I don't do anything else. I don't save anything else. I just put the $50,000 in my account. What do you think? Wait, if you're not putting in any more money? I'm not contributing anything else a month. I just put in the one lump sum. No. But it invests from age 21 until I'm 67. Oh, yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. What? 12 million. Now, what happens if I did get a lump sum at 21? Can I still hit my million? Yeah. Yeah. I can hit it with $100 a month at 18. I can hit it with $100 a month at 22. I can way surpass it with my used car payment at 22. Okay? Makes a difference. So, here's some perspective. $5 a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year. There's, there's your $100 a month right there with no more bagels, no more Einsteins, no more coffee, no more McDonald's, right? Figure it out. Wait, is that still with paying bills and everything? That's how much you would save. If you save $100 a month, okay, or if you stopped eating out or whatever it is, okay? Now, if you're like, Ashley, but I really like to eat out, okay, so budget it out. Figure out how much you want to spend on food. Buy a gift card to McDonald's for $20, and when the gift card's empty, I'm done, right? All right, so I always like to end with this story of why does it matter? Why is saving so important, right? We talked about those emergency funds, the God Only Knows Fund. You guys are at the perfect age. You're getting your first jobs, okay? When you get your first paycheck, do you think you're gonna notice if you start saving $25 a week? Will you even notice it? Like if you have it set up on automatic payments, you won't even notice, right? My little sister recently, well, within the last couple of years, switched her job and she was getting paid more money. So she had it set up, and she said, Ashley, I'm going to start my God Only Knows Fund, and I'm going to have it set up automatically, and it's going to go into this separate account, okay? So she had it set up. She didn't even really notice it. She was making more money anyway, so she didn't notice the $100 a month that went missing or whatever it was, okay? How many people in here have, like, nieces, nephews, little siblings, ever been around a five-year-old boy, okay? She has a five-year-old boy. He comes in, mom, mom, I put a rock in my ear. Can we see a five-year-old boy doing this? Absolutely, right? 
So she looks in his ear. She can't get the rock out. So she has to take him to the pediatrician. The pediatrician looks in and he goes, yeah, I can't get that out. You're going to have to go to the specialist. I'm going to send you to the ear, nose, and throat specialist. Okay? They go to the ear, nose, and throat specialist. The ear, nose, and throat specialist looks at it and goes, yeah, I see it. It's right there, but it is right up against his eardrum. And if he even wiggles a little bit when I'm pulling it out, I'm going to rupture his eardrum. So we're going to need to do surgery. Okay? My little sister's a nurse. She's got a good job. She's got good health insurance. But she has less than 24 hours to come up with $1,000 for his surgery. I'm getting rid of the kids. <laughs> They don't have a refund policy on that. There's no return policy on them. It's kind of crazy. Out that, that is one of those, like, no returns possible. Okay? So she's got 24 hours to come up with $1,000. Remember, Americans have a savings crisis. Most of us couldn't even come up with 400 without borrowing money or selling something, and selling the kid is not an option. So she calls me up, and she's kind of freaking out because she's a nurse. She's like, Ashley, oh, my goodness. I know everything that could go wrong when you go under general anesthesia. Like, I have all these scenarios going in my head, like, what happens if this happens? What if this happens? What? Like, she's freaking out. And she calls me because my daughter's the same age and actually had been in general anesthesia. So she calls me up. And then she ends our conversation and she goes, but you know what? I am so thankful that all I have to worry about is him doing surgery. And I don't have to worry about where I'm going to get the $1,000. Because I set it aside when I first got my job and it was going automatically into that fund, and so I already have it. I don't have to worry about that. Like, life happens, and it happens to all of us, whether it's your kid put a rock in his ear, or your car breaks down, or whatever it is. Like, we all have life happens moments, but when we set it aside automatically, the life happens moment doesn't have to be like an emergency, financial emergency, okay? So, that's my story of the importance of saving. All right. We're at time. I went a little over. Any questions? All right. How many of you guys have cell phones? Go ahead. Pull out your cell phone. Actually, these are all on your piece of paper, your budgeting piece of paper. So these are some of my books that I recommend, some of my favorite books. Okay, They're all on your list of like recommended resources. We've got some readers. Audio books are a great option, too. Okay. All right. What's something you learned today that you want to share with someone? Ashley, I didn't learn anything. Don't tell me that. Um, what? Okay, how budgeting and saving helps. What else? Anybody? I learned that you should not put a rock in your ear. <laughs> how to become a millionaire? How many millionaires there are? What would happen if you saved $100 a month at 18? Okay, is there anything that you want to implement before summer's over? Like anything you want to get started. Like, Ashley, before summer's over and I go back to school, I promise I'm going to have a bank account somewhere. A savings. I'm going to have a savings account somewhere, okay? And I'm going to nickname it for whatever I'm saving up for. Okay? All right. If you want to pull out your cell phone, you can take a picture of what I think your action steps should, should be. Open a savings account and name it for whatever you want to start saving for. Canada. Start tracking your expenses so you know... Oh, you know, if I spent less here, I could put more in savings. Okay? Get in the habit now of saving, and you will thank yourself so much. All right, that is all I got. Thank you for your patience and let me go a little over. Um, I do have, if you kind of want to test drive a lifestyle, these are fun workbooks, and it lets you pick your education level.